third beating for the group now, which is a bit crazy. I'm not really sure where the year is going. Um, yeah. Oh, hang on. Sorry, something's funny has happened. There we go. It always goes weird when we start recording, and I don't know why. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Um, this is uh, basically the MPT for Nature Group is just a space for us to engage with the local community, um, just to let you know of any activities that are going on over the next few months um, and anything that you might want to get involved with. Uh, and also just to provide advice and guidance for any actions that you guys might want to take for nature in your local area. Um, but we also want you guys to use this space as a way to sort of connect with other like minded people or community groups as well. Um, so please do introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, tell us a little bit about yourselves and maybe what you're hoping to get out of this group or you know how you could link up with other people um yeah so just for anybody who hasn't been here before i'll skip over this as quickly as i can because i know i've said this about three times now <laughs> um yeah so um the local nature partnership um <clears throat> or the MPT for Nature group is kind of a subgroup of the Local Nature Partnership um, and the LNP or the Local Nature Partnership Network is a Welsh Government initiative that has basically created local partnerships across Wales. Um, so these are facilitated by local authorities um, and sort of made up of interested parties like local environmental groups, businesses and public bodies. Um, so these partnerships are then responsible for planning and carrying out practical actions to help protect and improve their local environment. Um, so in the MPT partnership, we have about 60 members at the moment. Um, so this slide just shows a few of them. Um, a few of our members are here tonight. Our vice chair, Catherine, is on the call. Um, and I'm sure if you've got any questions for her, she won't mind asking them, answering them. Um, yeah. So what do we do as an LMP? Uh, quite a lot. <laughs> um, so it ranges from things like developing plans and policies, um, such as the State of Nature and Nature Recovery Action Plan. Um, so this basically sets out how we're going to try and conserve and recover nature in MPT. Um, so the partnership is also really good for sort of networking and best practice sharing with lots of ex experts from different fields sharing their knowledge in the partnership. Um, we also carry out a lot of practical conservation projects. Um, and we also submit a lot of biodiversity data to our local record centre, um, as well as providing ecological advice to both the council and the public. Um, so, yeah, if anyone would like to attend the main partnership meetings, you are more than welcome. It's open to anybody. Uh, they can get quite technical, but it is a really good way to stay informed about what conservation action is going on in MPT as well as this group. <laughs> Um, so we are going to be carrying on with our little featured habitat section of the meeting. Um, so this is just to give you guys an idea of the variety of habitats that we have in MPT. Um, so we've already looked at woodland and grasslands in the previous meetings. So if you're interested, you can go back and have a look at them on Facebook. Um, but this time we're going to look at our heathland and moorland habitats. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to Rose now, um, who is going to tell you a bit about these habitats um, and our plan to maintain and restore them. I'll mute myself. Um, yeah, so my name's Rose. I'm I'm one of the ecologists. For those who don't know, I'm one of the ecologists for Neath Talbot Council, and I act as secretariat for the Neath Talbot Local Nature Partnership. Um, and over the last few years, the LNP has been working really hard to gather together all the data on habitats and species in Neath Talbot, so it's just to help us make a bit of an informed assessment on the state of nature in NPT and what where we might need to worry or where is doing OK. So that is going to be available really, really soon, hopefully this autumn. Well, I think we're on track to do it this autumn. Um, so that's a, a state of nature document explaining where all the habitats are um, with an action plan alongside it with ideas for how we can take action to protect, conserve, restore nature. So that's actions that any of us could do or perhaps certain organisations, but you know, there'll be plenty on there. Um, we've looked at each broad habitat type in turn, and one of those broad habitat types is heathland and moorland. So heathland and moorland in um, our broad classification includes marshy grassland, um, acid grassland, heathland, moorland and freeth. And freeth is uh, otherwise known as coid kai sometimes, in depends where you are in Wales. Um, but it's also known as the upland fringe. It's basically the area that's between the lowlands and the highlands. 
Um, so, you know, you might have your, your pasture and your farmland a bit further down, then you have an area of bracken, scrub, um, open heath, that kind of thing. Um, it's a bit of a mosaic habitat and it's really important one um, that we get sometimes in Neathport Talbot. And these habitats all club together, they account for about 20% of the land cover of Neathport Talbot. We don't know fully the extent of the condition of all of that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it has been lost to conifer plantations, for example, or inappropriate grazing. Um, so yeah, a heathlands, a lot of them are in a degraded condition, unfortunately. Marshy grassland, we've put it in this um, category. Um, it's a really important habitat for Neathwood Albert. It supports some of our really um, unique communities of plants and species, um, such as the marsh fritillary butterfly, for example. And yeah, as I said, freeze, unfortunately, a lot of it's been lost to conifer plantation. Uh, where they do, where it does remain, it's really important for species like cuckoo, dark green fritillaries, lots of butterfly species, actually. And um, yeah. Uh, things like stone chats and you'll see all up in the freeze. So these are some of the species that um, are of conservation concern up on in our heathland and moorlands habitats. Um, lots of reptiles, reptiles love these kinds of habitats. Cuckoos, we said, skylarks, linnets, moss, cardabies, the marsh fertility. There's lots of species that depend on these habitats. Um, and you, some of them you might only find in these habitats. Unfortunately, we've talked about woodland, which is in good condition in Eastport Talbot, and we talked about grasslands, which is unfortunately in poor condition as well. But heathland and moorland is under intense pressure. Lack of appropriate management is a big thing. Uh, broken connectivity, most of it where it exists is separated by uh, you know, for example, forestry coops or development or farmland from other blocks of heathland and moorland. And there's also a big problem with invasive non-native species, tree species, the usual ubiquitous balsam and things as well will move up into these habitats. Um, so unfortunately, we have had to classify the state of nature of heathland and moorland in Neathport Harbour as poor, sadly. Um, yeah, that's of major concern. The value of these habitats for various species is obviously quite important. Um, but we have, as I said, it, as I said, the state of nature document, instead of all being all doom and gloom, we put in some actions in there that hopefully we can we can all club together and do to try and help these habitats recover. So some of those that we put into this um, into this plan is continuing management for our artillery butterflies. There's an amazing group of volunteers coordinated by Butterfly Conservation South Wales group. Um, they do some incredible surveying management work, coordinating management work for our marshy grasslands. Um, for example, Seven Sisters and Crynan area, there's a huge amount of work goes on up there. Um, so keeping that going, helping to support that where we can. Trying to find out more as well about where this marshy grassland is. There's a lot on basically anywhere that you look in these Port Albert, the farms will have an element of marshy grassland on them or, you know, at private landowners. Um, so finding out where that is, what kind of condition it is, that can help us to, to plan for its future or support landowners where we need to. One of the big things that's threatening these habitats at the moment is the tree planting drive. Um, We've talked about this many times and everyone will will push it forward. But yeah, when it comes to tree planting, it's right tree, right place. And this is one of the habitats that is quite often looked at as waste ground or something that it's fine to, to stick a load of trees in plastic tubes on, which is not what we want to see. And um, we can actually look at restoring and creating new habitats as well. Um, you know, there's lots of perhaps where there's a non-protective forestry coop, could it be looked at to restore for heathland instead, if, if that's what it was before? And you will, you'll quite often, if you go up into the plantations, you'll see a lot of heathland and moorland um, around the, uh, the um, you know, in between the coops. That's one of the main sort of habitats that's 
left up there. And this is one of the things we wanted to focus on um, for this habitat is it's a big issue in Nipotalba, unfortunately. Um, adder persecution is still a problem in the county. Um, yeah, Elaine, <laughs> Elaine's nodding, you know about this. Um, unfortunately, adder is our only venomous snake that we have in the UK. Well, only native venomous snake. Um, and as we probably all know, they'll usually go in the other direction if they see a human. But if you happen to pick it up or run over it with your dog or you know, they might be threatened and they might think about biting and that scares people, sadly. So, yeah, as we know, they don't want to bite people. They want to save their energy. They want to save their venom for their prey. So they only ever bite when they're very threatened. They also, I think it's about 90% of the time, they deliver a dry bite, so they never actually deliver any venom. Um, so there's no point in them wasting venom on us. They can never fit us in their mouth. So, you know, <laughs> there's, there's, while you should be cautious and not go around picking up adders, there's not really any reason to be that frightened of them. Um, but this is something that people, you know, if, Councillor Hurley's ward, you know, you might have issues up there. People, people are just worried about it and and things can go the wrong way. So it's an easy eat the ARC Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust have got um, loads of information on this. So this is one of their posters. Um, so if you live in an area where there's adders present on local walks, maybe you can write or share posts about how people can avoid. And unwanted interactions with adders, so you can stick to paths, keeping dogs on leads, for example, especially in spring when they're more active, they're looking to breed, but they're also quite low energy because of the weather. So, um, yeah, that's, um, yeah, it's, there's loads of information on that website and we can tag it into the information we send around afterwards. Um, I've just seen, yeah, Tara's just put in the chat about um, if they do bite you, it's very unlikely as well that it'll actually cause an adverse effect. It's um, if you might happen to be um, allergic, same as if you were allergic to bee stings and things, so then you can have a really bad reaction. But for most people, it shouldn't cause too many issues. So, but they're just stunning creatures as well. To go out and see an adder is like one of the most amazing things because they're, it's like where's Wally as well so if you do happen to see one the satisfaction I mean you can see where it's in this photo where it's sat on the bracken they're so perfectly camouflaged that um yeah it's just, it's really satisfying if you do actually find one but if people um wanted to help out as well ARC um, are currently run, running a survey they're running a project called Adder Action at the moment which is aiming to um, help reverse decline, engage communities and raise awareness of adder conservation. So it's a very long link there on the page. As usual, we will send round the slides from from the um, what we've talked about today. So that link will be on the slide or in the email. So you'll be able to click on that. They'd really appreciate some feedback, basically. And um, yeah, that's Ethan and Moreland in a nutshell, I think. Great, thank you, Rose. And I can definitely second that spotting an adder is very satisfying. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've got um, a couple of speakers with us tonight um, just to chat to you about what they've going on, what they've got going on. Um, so our first guest is Witch Hazel Wildwood um, from the Orchard Project, which is a very appropriate name. <laughs> thank you um, and uh, yeah, she's going to talk to us about um, the project, what it is, and how you guys get involved. So yeah, I'll hand over to you now. Which Hazel, if that's all right. Um, so you. have you, you've got your screen? own slides. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll stop presenting now. There you go. Sorry, just looking. This is my presentation. Yes, looks like it. Cool. Uh, oh, hang on, sorry. <laughs> it's like I have to put it into slideshow before. Do I put it in slideshow before I put it on? Sorry. No. That was fine then, which Hazel. It, yeah, because you're my notes. Just... Oh, well, okay. Oh, yeah, no, if you're trying to find your notes, there's a little dot, dot, dot. Um, yeah, I want to get rid of the notes. Oh, okay. 
Oh, no, we can't we, see them. We couldn't see your nose. Oh, can't you see them? Oh, cool. Oh, that's no. good. I'm not used to <laughs> teams, so I'm just... Sorry, bear with me. I'm no, it's good. Team. It's a good feature. <laughs> great. So, thanks very much for inviting me today. It's really great to meet with you all. Um, um, myself and my colleague Kate uh, have been working for the Orchard Project in Swansea for the last couple of years. And I'm planning to give a sh just a short talk today about the Orchard Project and also to bring in a little bit about Orchard Biodiversity, if that's of interest to people. Is that OK? Fantastic. Great. So I'm um, sorry, I'm going to have to leave the meeting a little bit before seven as well, a little bit early. Sorry, so I've got a second meeting tonight to meet. <laughs> So the Orchard Project, over the last 10 years, we've planted, restored and supported over 400 community orchards throughout the UK. Um, so we are there to create healthier, edible community spaces, build individual and community well-being, contribute to a better food system and to enable and celebrate the establishment of community run orchards, particularly in like urban areas of, of, of the other cities. Um, we have bases in London, Manchester, Glasgow, Edinburgh and Swansea at the moment. So we, um, we focus on orchards because we feel they you know, mostly improve physical well-being, whether people are volunteering in them, just walking through them or, or just having the presence of them in their neighbourhoods. Orchards significantly increase local biodiversity, as many of you will know, and there are specific species that are only present in orchard environments. Community orchards provide a local sustainable food source that can be gathered and enjoyed by all, which includes top fruits such as apples, pears and plums, but also can include soft fruit, raspberries, black currants and strawberries. Orchard harvesting and the celebrations bring people together, so that improves community cohesion. Our work is particularly focused on prioritising communities in the most deprived areas because this is where we can have you know, the most impact. We support groups to create and maintain um, orchards, so we help engage local people, we offer support to volunteers, we engage and train core volunteers and we assist with site preparation and orchard design. We also advise on things like safety and risk assessments and offer guidance and support to plant the trees and make sure they're properly guarded to reduce the risk of vandalism and strimmer damage. So here in Swansea, we've supported a number of new urban orchards, including local parks, community gardens. Oh, I've gone past that slide, have we? <laughs> Here in Swansea, we've set up, um, you know, supported new new urban orchards. Uh, we have worked with local hospitals, sheltered housing um, and schools. We've worked with local people to increase their skills and confidence to manage their orchards and have an expectation of the longevity of the site. So basically, we're, we don't manage the orchards ourselves. We try and support groups in the areas to do it for themselves because the idea is that there's, you know, um, we build up their skills and their confidence to do it so that they will carry on maintaining the orchard and there'll be some kind of long longevity of support for the orchard rather than us coming in doing you know planting orchard sticking an orchard up you know and then and then fleeing and leaving it um, unmanaged so the idea is that people in the area have skills and confidence to kind of take that on that's the idea um, we've also supported the restoration of 10 local orchards uh, we encourage the use of Welsh heritage varieties which have local resilience and link with Welsh orchard traditions. For example, Channel Beauty, which is a Swansea variety, Brith Mara, which is from Newport, Machen, which is from Chepstow, Pren Glass, it's a St Dogmail's variety, and there's quite well known Bardsey from Bardsey Island, a very resilient variety. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> along with the orchards, there are other diverse habitats that can be created and fostered to create a mosaic. So hedgerow, obviously native species such as rowan, blackthorn, hazel, hawthorn, gelder rose, spindle, dog rose. These all provide additional shelter and food for wildlife. Hedges also help shield the fruit trees from the wind, connect the orchard with the surrounding landscape. Ponds are great to attract birds, mammals and insects, great crested newts, toads, other amphibians. Um, bees drink from the pond um, and then, you know, blossom in the orchard and early provide of nectar flying insects and um, hopefully, ideally, in a good orchard, there'll be trees of different 
um, different ages, some of which might provide Edward, for example, to talk about in a bit. We encourage less mowing around orchard trees, ideally leaving the whole orchard grass long and just cut maybe once or twice a year, apart from mowing a few paths through. Sometimes that's you know, a little bit of an issue with ground workers, but I think it's sort of easier to say, just here's a big circle around the orchard, just leave all of that and maybe just cut the path through. Um, that, that Sometimes they, they are willing to do that. Traditionally, orchards are priority habitat under the UK's Biodiversity Action Plan, as some of you will know. They are different from woodland, for example, because the trees are spaced apart, so it's more open and sunny than woodland and therefore good for flying insects and warm dead wood. Um, fruit, fruit trees decay early, they're early senescent, so older orchards have lots of fungi and invertebrates that live on decaying wood. The insects living in traditional orchards are food source of birds and bats, and the trees can also provide a nesting site and also fruit for birds, mammals and invertebrates. You might find mice, hedgehogs, foxes and even badgers. And you often see lichen, mosses and liverworts on the bark and a number of climbers such as ivy, honeysuckle and old man's beard providing a nectar source. And also semi-parasitic semi mistletoe can be seen as well. So unimproved grassland in orchard environment together with fruit trees provides a really important habitat and the combination of other microclimates such as hedgerows and wildflowers, scrub and ponds can all result in a, in a rich and biodiverse environment. The orchard ecosystem is abundant and um, um, blossom is an excellent nectar source for many insects and bees, hoverflies and moths. And these invertebrates shown here are only found in orchards. So uh, number one is a noble chafer beetle. Number two, across the top is orchard tooth fungus, quite interesting fungus. We've got the on the bottom row, we've got apple lace bug, it's rather beautiful, um, a blunt leaved bristle moss, and a really interesting looking mistletoe marble moth as well. Sorry, my slides are a little bit out of order. <laughs> uh, where's that slide gone? Okay, I'll just talk to you without the slide. So um, I was going to talk to you about veteran orchards. Fruit trees, as I said, are early senescent. So as the orchard develops, fruit trees provide an increasingly varied habitat and exhibit veteran tree characteristics relatively quickly. So that's things like dead wood, hollow trunks, split bark and holes, which support many invertebrates. Some of the features that are provided by more veteran trees include falling dead wood, fallen dead wood and standing dead wood, bracket fungi, beetle holes and galleries under the bark, trunk or branch cavities and fungi eating the heartwood which create rot holes for birds, bats etc to roost and there are over 400 species of invertebrates living on the decaying wood and they in turn provide food for other animals. Um, so for, for a new orchard, an idea of how much maintenance, um, if you've got a group managing an orchard we would expect imagine there would be weekly watering of the newly planted trees for the first couple of years from spring until autumn. Um, so that's sometimes a bit tricky because there's not always a good water source. So we always look at that before we put an orchard in place, like where's the water going to come from? And we can use these uh, interesting uh, watering mechanism, which is called a, an H2Go bag. So some of you may know of these and they are large kind of bags of water that fit into a wheelbarrow with a big um, top on them that you can undo and you can fill them up and they trundle them down in the wheelbarrow and then tip them to water your trees. So they're quite useful if you've got access to a wheelbarrow and it's fairly sort of level pathway and so on. And they only cost about a tenner, so they're really great. Um, but ideally there's like, you know, local tap or something. Um, we also ask our volunteers to check the health of the trees. We write a management plan with them and uh, we're very big on wood chip mulch. So all our trees get um, added a layer of wood chip mulch when we plant them and then every year in spring for, for at least for the first few years we uh, recommend doing that again so that we help to retain moisture and reduce the weed competition and also help start building up a really good fungal soil because um, basically when you're planting an orchard you're planting often into grass which is quite bacterial and trees actually like a fungal um, dominant soil and survive much better and have much better resilience especially this time you know this kind of climate we're having right now uh, it makes them much more resilient if there's a, if there's fungal associations going on. So we try to encourage that with a simple application of mulch, which often we can get, you know, from local arborists and so on. We also train our volunteers up in pruning. 
um, with the timing of doing the apples and pears in the winter, and we'll do things like pruner species in the summer. Um, so I hope that gives you a little overview of our work and possibilities for watchers in local area. Thank you very much. Sorry, my <laughs> slides are a little bit erratic there. Sorry. <laughs> Stop presenting. There we are. Oh, thanks, Richard. Oh, that was great. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I don't know if you've already done it, you could like pop your details in the chat and if anybody wants to pick your brain or yes. if anybody has any questions now. Good, I'll do that. There's one in the chat from Fred actually about um, how how do people go about accessing your support? OK, so um, you can email us and I shall put my email in now. And then give me an email and we can have a chat then. Oh, Catherine, you got a question? Hi, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Zilla. Well, that was kind of a really nice presentation. It's nice to see what you're up to. Um, I was just sort of curious how much take up you've had in Neath for Talbot, um, and also whether you've sort of managed to link in with sort of I mean, obviously, you know, we're all interested from a biodiversity point of view, but there's a huge benefit from a sort of food security point of view and whether you manage to link in with food banks or um, sort of more community focused organisations in East Talbot. That's a really good question. So um, we are working a little more. We've got um, an orchard um, linked with Titaria in one of the Titarian sheltered housing places. Um, and we're looking at some more for this year. And I think Kate's done the planting of one somewhere else in Port Talbot. So there's a, few, there's a couple um, and we're starting to work more with um, restoring some of the existing ones as well. We haven't worked with any food related projects in, in uh, Port no. Talbot yet, but we are linked in Swansea. Uh, Swansea has some exciting news. Some of you may or may not know that we have a project called Boy of Avatawi, which is uh, becoming a sustainable food place or city food place and we've just been accepted to go on that sort of route so hopefully Swansea is going to be really upping its game with food security and the Orchard Project is definitely like one of those partners with that so yeah certainly in Swansea but not yet so much in in Port Harbour yet but you know willing certainly willing to look at that. <laughs> I mean are you, are you linked in with CVS at all because obviously they've got links to sort of much broader sort of range of organisations than you might see in in this group. CVS. Yes. 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 Brilliant. So hopefully, hopefully there'll be some take up on that then. Mm, 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 definitely. And we also link with another project um, called Sweet Pickings, um, which is a group that, that, that harvests fruit. So they are they in a way they're kind of like our, our arm with that in Swansea because they they are um, a group of volunteers who who manage the harvesting of trees and stuff through Swansea that you know in people's gardens and everywhere really and so they're linked with those projects so at the moment I guess they're doing it more than us really. Mm -hmm. Okay brilliant thank you. Thank you for that question. Anybody else have a question or shall I move on? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks again, which is that was great. Um, so summer obviously is in full swing um, and there's a lot going on. Uh, so as usual, I've put together a list um, of events and activities um, for the next three months. Um, so obviously it's not quite so nice to think ahead to autumn, although it's not maybe it's not such a horrible thought with this heat. <laughs> um, yeah, but there's lots of still there's still lots of fun things you can do in the autumn as well. So it's not all bad. <laughs> Um, so first things first, from now, well it started a couple of weeks ago I think, but from now until the 7th of August is Butterfly Conservation's Big Butterfly Count. Uh, so this is a UK wide survey that is aimed at assessing the health of our um, of our habitats by counting the number of butterflies that you can spot in 15 minutes. Um, so I've popped the link, sorry if you can hear background noise, my dog is chewing something he shouldn't be. <laughs> Um, but I've yeah popped the link to the butterfly conservation website, which has all of the information on how you can take part. Um, it's a nice little activity to do on a sunny day, obviously, as long as it's not too hot. Um, and then next on the 13th of August is the Lost Peatlands Wild Blitz. Um, so this is going to be at Cummer Community Wild Space. 
um, and it's going to be a full day of activities. Uh, Rose has been working really hard to get everything organised. Um, so we're going to be there from 9am until 10pm. Um, so come along whenever you want for as long as you want. Um, there's something for everyone. Uh, yeah, it's family friendly, lots of guided walks and obviously species ID tips from some of our local experts. Um, so yeah, loads of different events. We've got moth morning, reptile ramble, bug hunt, plant hunt, um, a bog talk, bee walk, um, reptile walk, butterfly walk, bug hunt. Oh, we've got more bug hunts. Um, and then an evening bird walk and a bat walk. So yeah, something for everyone, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, so definitely come along if you can. It'd be a good day. Um, and then next on the 26th of August is International Bat Night. Um, so we are going to be running a bat walk for the MPT for Nature group um, in Margam Park. Um, obviously weather permitting, but hopefully it'll be a nice evening. Um, we haven't advertised it yet, but we'll send an email around with the Eventbrite link soon. Um, we are going to have to limit numbers to 25 so it doesn't get too overcrowded. Um, so we're, yeah, that's why we're using the booking system. Um, Neil Price is going to be um, giving the tour, which I think is fair to say he's a local bat expert. Um, yeah, so we'll be walking around the grounds of Margam Park, uh, which is home to 14 species of bats. Um, and there's only 17 or 18 in the UK, so that puts it into perspective. Um, yeah, so please come along if you'd like to um, learn a bit more about our bats. Hopefully it'll be a nice evening. Um, and then uh, now is a good time to introduce our second speaker, if that's all right with you, Aaron. Um, so there's a, bet, a bat carer workshop coming up on the 20th of August. Um, so Aaron from Glamorgan Gra Bat Group is here to talk to us a bit about it now. So uh, have you got any slides, Aaron, or are you just going to chat? OK, cool. All right. <laughs> well, I'll hand over now. <laughs> sorry, no, it's just a two minute plug, basically. Sorry. Um, yeah, just to say um, on the. Uh, the get the date correct here before that Saturday, the 20th of August. Uh, looking to have a introduction workshop to bat care and bat ambulance driving um, led by a couple of bat workers from Cardiff. Um, it's not actually in Neef, uh, it's in uh, Llanelli Wetland Centre, but that's purely because um, Brian was the warden sort of um, offered me the venue really. Um, so the idea is there's a lack of bat work, uh, bat carers um, within Neef, well in, anywhere west of Cardiff really. So it's just um, an effort to try and get more people willing to, even if it's just to take care or help dry pick up bats, uh, anything like that. So um, it's plugged in for the 20th of August, so um, at 2, 2 p.m. So I'd just be grateful if you could share it around with your networks, basically. That's really it for me on that one. Because, um, yeah, there's at the moment, there are really only two people that I'm aware of west of Bridgend that actually uh, are registered bat carers. There's a few other people that um, take the odd bat here and there, but yeah, only two that are actively doing it. So uh, we really need some more people. I go. I got a little poster of a couple of noctils. Um, yeah. So yeah, if, if anyone, um, if you're able to share that um, that poster amount, or there's the Facebook group as well, the Morgan Bat Group. Um, there's an event on there. So um, if, if yeah, if you could share that, I would be very, very good. Thank you. Aaron, I don't know if you wanted to introduce your audio moth. Oh, yeah, yeah, so well. yeah. So um, some I bought myself and some were great, uh, glad, were very kindly donated by, um, yes, um, I can, uh, I, well, the details are on there, but I can forward the, any more details as well um, to you. Is it Rose and then you can share out? Uh, just take that question, yeah. Um, yeah, so Subrek donated a bunch of audio moths, which if you're not aware of what they are, they're really small bat detectors. They kind of look like microchips. Um, they're very cheap, um, which is great. Um, so they kindly donated me about 10 and I bought five myself. So I've been putting them all around at the moment, Gower, but I do want to put them in uh, around some woodlands and Fifi farmlands um, in Neef. Um, so if anyone is interested in doing it, it's quite onerous for just me to do it. Um, taking them, they only last a few days at best. So you got to obviously download the data, change the batteries and stuff like that. So um, if anyone's interested in doing that, that would be great. The idea is that will feed into a um, a bat atlas for 
the area covered by the Morgan Baku, Neath Talbot and Swansea, which I'm hoping to do maybe at the end of this year, at the end of this bat season when I've uh, collected all the data. So if anyone wants to contribute again, that'll be brilliant. That's it for me. Great, thank anyone you. Got any um, questions on it? If you want, you can share the, the Facebook link in the chat. Make it okay, easier yeah, if you well, like, but yeah. yeah thank fine. you. That's great. Awesome. Okay, moving on to September. Um, so on the from the 16th to the 25th of September is the Great British Beach Clean, which is quite self-explanatory. Just go and clean a beach. <laughs> um, but you can either organise one yourself or you can go to an organised beach clean. Um, bit of a um, sort of disclaimer: make sure you do it safely. You've got the right equipment. Um, but yeah, I don't think I had a look on the website. It doesn't look like there are any organized ones for MPT yet. So maybe but see, you can organize, you can just like put in the details and organize one yourself. So if anybody wants to do that with the community group, community group, it'd be a nice group activity. Um, it's yeah, it's a really great thing to get involved with. Obviously, a lot of conservation work is quite big picture, long term. Um, so it's quite nice to do something that you can see an immediate benefit from little wins. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the link to it is on the slide if you want to have a look at the website. Um, and then sort of from the end of September to the end of October um, is seed gathering season. Um, so obviously we've been talking about tree planting um, in this in this talk and also in previous ones before. Um, so, you know, sort of how you should go about it. Um, and one of the best things you can do is to collect seeds from local trees that are sort of used to the local weather and climate. Um, and yeah, so between these two months is the time to do that. Um, it's also a really nice activity to do with with kids if you've got if you've got children or you know a, a school or something. Especially if you're looking for conkers. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's tips and advice on the Tree Council website, uh, including how to sort of pot up and look after your seedlings. Well, I'm sure Witch Hazel could give you some advice on that as well. <laughs> um, so yeah. If you are a community group wanting to plant trees or maybe start an orchard of your own, this is definitely the best way to go about it. Um, it obviously does take a bit more time, but it is worth it. <laughs> um, and then into October, um, autumn is fungi season um, and UK Fungus Day is the 8th of October. Um, so it's a good excuse to get around and have a hunt in the leaf litter or on trees in woodlands. Um, and it's quite surprising what you can spot when you look a little closer. Um, so fungi are obviously notoriously difficult to identify, um, but there are some common species that are quite distinctive um, and a lot of species do have really great names. So identifying them is quite fun if you can. <laughs> um, yeah, so the UK Fungus Day website has loads of information on as well as some ID videos for some easier species um, and lots of guides for beginners as well. So, yeah, if you're looking for something to do on a drizzly autumn day in the woods. <laughs> Um, and then finally, back to bats. Um, there's another bat event in October, which is International Bat Week. Um, and obviously you'll all be bat obsessed after our bat walk and um, becoming bat carers. <laughs> um, so you'll want them rooted in your garden. Uh, yeah, so maybe a fun activity you could do if you're a bit, if you're a fan of DIY is to build a bat house. Um, they don't really need to be anything fancy. This is quite a straightforward guide on how to build your own from the wildlife trusts. Um, so I popped the link on the how to page on the Wildlife Trust for the Wildlife Trust website, um, as well as a link to the Bat Week website, which has a lot of information on as well. Yeah. So this has been quite a short meeting, but that's not so bad when it's hot outside, is it? <laughs> um, yeah, I hope you found it useful. Um, we're going to move the next meeting to a Wednesday night because quite a few people have said that Tuesdays aren't great for them. Um, so hopefully that'll be better. Um, so the next one is going to be um, the 12th of October at 6 p.m. Um, and as usual, mine and Rose's details are on the slide if anybody wants to get in touch for any advice or anything. Um, so yeah, we can stop recording now. Um, and if anyone has any questions or wants to have a chat, we can pop our cameras back on and have our mics on as well. <laughs>